I have already said that in the early 19th century, when the theorists of independence and sovereignty of Ukraine appeared, they assumed that an independent Ukraine should have very good relations with Russia. But due to the historical development, those territories were part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Poland, where Ukrainians were persecuted and treated quite brutally as well as were subject to cruel behavior. There were also attempts to destroy their identity. All this remained in the memory of the people. When World War II broke out, part of this extremely nationalist elite collaborated with Hitler, believing that he would bring them freedom. I mean, it's true that when German troops in the Second World War um, moved into Ukraine and through Ukraine, they were hailed as liberators by these, um, you know, um, elements and, 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 and parties. Of course, there were other things happening as well in the Soviet Union. There were... Um, you know, we, you had all this, uh, the creation of the cold horse where land was taken from farmers and you had essentially the, the creation of huge agro combines, uh, quite similar to what happened at the same time in the US. Of course, in the US, um, under capitalism, the bankers did it. Um, you know, the Federal Reserve let 10,000 banks go bust and the bankers called in then they were taken over, the depositors lost their money, so farmers that had money with the local banks, they lost their money. And at the same time, the banks would be taken over by bigger banks, Wall Street banks and so on. And they would still demand those loans back. Um, and of course, the money wasn't there, so the farms that were the collateral were taken. So thousands and thousands of farmers also lost their land in America. And that's when big agro business, Monsanto and whatever, um, the big agricultural combines became very powerful and, and dominant in the US. Similar in the Soviet Union, Ukraine is the breadbasket of Europe actually. So the agricultural sector has been very important. And of course, if you do drastic reforms like that, a lot of people are very unhappy and you, you, you cause disaster. There was starvation, just like in the US, when you get essentially too much centralization, central control. Um, it's no good. You need decentralization, local autonomy. Um, and so you can imagine, you know, German troops coming in, oh, liberators, yes, you know, if you have disasters like that, um, centralized agriculture. But the, the other element, and that is what President Putin is talking about here, is literally this ideology that had been created. Um, now, we learned that it started with the Austrian military leadership. And Austria, of course, is a very multi-ethnic state. It would be interesting to figure out who exactly said this and whose idea this was. And, you know, um, maybe it was already British agents in there. But clearly, um, Britain was very much involved in seeding the fascist movements in Europe. I wouldn't be surprised if the, the Nazi uh, movement in Ukraine did not actually come from the German Nazis as one assumes nowadays looking back, but actually was one of those parallel Nazi seeded developments that happened at the same time, uh, more or less independent from each other, but from the same source, supported by the same source, giving ideas, money, funds, and supporting the right people, having agents in place. Um, that wouldn't be surprising. In fact, it would be quite consistent. The German troops, even the SS troops, made Hitler's collaborators do the dirtiest work of exterminating the Polish and Jewish population. Hence this brutal massacre of the Polish and Jewish population, as well as the Russian population too. This was led by the persons who are well known, Bandera, Shukevich, it was those people who were made national heroes. That is the problem. And we are constantly told that nationalism and neo-Nazism exist in other countries as well. Yes, they are seedlings, 
but we approved them. And other countries fight against them. But Ukraine is not the case. These people have been made into national heroes in Ukraine. Monuments to those people have been erected. They are displayed on flags. Their names are shouted by crowds that walk with torches, as it was in Nazi Germany. These were people who exterminated Poles, Jews and Russians. It is necessary to stop this practice and prevent the dissemination of this concept. I say that Ukrainians are part of the one Russian people. They say, no, we are a separate people. Okay, fine. If they consider themselves a separate people, they have the right to do so, but not on the basis of Nazism, the Nazi ideology. Would you be satisfied with the territory that you have now? I will finish answering the question. You just asked a question about neo-Nazism and denazification. Look, he clearly is in charge of this interview. <laughs> uh, Tucker Carlson jumped the topic when uh, President Putin feels he hasn't properly fully answered the question concerning the denazification. The president of Ukraine visited Canada. This story is well known, but being silenced in the Western countries. The Canadian Parliament introduced a man who, as the Speaker of the Parliament said, fought against the Russians during the World War II. Well, who fought against the Russians during the World War II? Hitler and his accomplices. It turned out that this man served in the SS troops. He personally killed Russians, Poles and Jews. The SS troops consisted of Ukrainian nationalists who did this dirty work. The president of Ukraine stood up with the entire parliament of Canada and applauded this man. How can this be imagined? The president of Ukraine himself, by the way, is a Jew by nationality. Really, my question is, what do you do about it? I mean, Hitler's been dead for 80 years. Nazi Germany no longer exists. And so, true. And so... I think what you're saying is you want to extinguish or at least control Ukrainian nationalism, but how? How do you do that? Listen to me. Your question is very subtle, and I can tell you what I think. Do not take offense. Of course. This question appears to be subtle. It is quite pesky. You say Hitler has been dead for so many years, 80 years, but his example lives on. People who exterminated Jews, Russians, and Poles are alive. And the president, the current president of today's Ukraine, applauds him in the Canadian parliament gives a standing ovation. Can we say that we have completely uprooted this ideology if what we see is happening today? That is what the Nazification is in our understanding. We have to get rid of those people who maintain this concept and support this practice and try to preserve it. That is what the Nazification is. That is what we mean. Right. My question was a little more specific. It was, of course, not a defense of Nazis, new or otherwise, it was a practical question. You don't control the entire country. You don't control Kiev. You don't seem like you want to. So how, how do you eliminate a culture or an ideology or feelings or a view of history in a country that you don't control? What do you do about that? You know, as strange as it may seem to you, during the negotiations at Istanbul, we did agree that we have it all in writing. Neo-Nazism would not be cultivated in Ukraine, including that it would be prohibited at the legislative level. Mr. Carson, we agreed on that. This, it turns out, can be done during the negotiation process. And there's nothing humiliating for Ukraine as a modern civilized state. 
Is any state allowed to promote Nazism? It is not, is it? Uh, that is it. <clears throat> um, will there be talks and why haven't there been talks? Because he's right, because in Germany, for example, uh, in Germany, um, Nazism is illegal and you can't um, say certain things, you can't show even Nazi symbols. Uh, recently there was a court case against an American author who put um, a swastika on his book cover even though it was, I can't remember uh, what the precise story was, but you know, he himself was I think clearly not a Nazi at all, but that was already a criminal offense just to have that swastika there and so on. So it's possible to legislate. So, and that's what President Putin is saying. Uh, in Ukraine, these Nazis have done a lot of bad things and they're still full of hate and they want to kill people. They talk about killing Russians and so on. And that's just not on. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, that's forbidden in many countries. So why not in Ukraine? In fact, why, why is it apparently okay that there's um, Nazis in powerful positions in Ukraine. Now, of course, you see, <laughs> that's where we have to talk about uh, the deep state again, the secret team. And here, President Putin is quite, I think, quite deliberate in not bringing it up because he doesn't have to. But it's good, I think, for, for the audience to be aware of this, you see. Um, after 1945, um, what happened to, the, to some of the key Nazi um, you know, officials that were very active in the German Nazi um, secret service? Um, and of course, there's usually in most countries the domestic secret service and the international secret service. So in the UK, the domestic one is MI5 and the international one is MI6. In America, the domestic one is the FBI um, and the international one is the CIA. Although, of course, you know, there's also NSA in the UK, GCHQ and so on. So there's other agencies and America has so many. It's, it is uh, quite uh, stunning. But um, now the Nazis also had a foreign secret service for the international stuff. Um, and you see, the Nazis um, already... Uh, during the Second World War and, and perhaps starting earlier were cultivating their so-called assets in other countries and because the Soviet Union was considered an enemy or potential enemy during a certain time periods, um, of course they were working on plans on how to disintegrate the Soviet Union and they were, so the, the German Nazi um, secret service, foreign secret service, was working on cultivating uh, Ukrainian Nazis, which is why a lot of people think it's a, it's a German thing, but I think it, it, it actually probably started much earlier, even when the German uh, Nazi movement was created after the First World War, but that's another story now. So, after the, so during the Second World War, um, the Germans had assets in Ukraine who were Nazis um, and were supported by Germany and the idea was they can be you know at the same time very nationalistic and anti-Russian as part of this Nazi ideology so essentially from a Russian perspective the in, in Ukraine the Nazi ideology is identical with being fiercely anti-Russian and fiercely um, nationalistic but sort of hubristic, like we are better than the Russians and the Russians are, you know, not uh, worthy and whatever. Um, that's one thing what the, the German um, international uh, Nazi secret service did um, during the Second World War. But the other thing they did, and that's not mentioned here, but is equally relevant, highly relevant for this day and age, is they supported um, the movement that became the Muslim Brotherhood. That was German supported because the idea was, okay, there's a lot of uh, Soviet republics that are actually majority Muslim. Well, that's another angle. We can work on them and turn them against Russia um, and support Muslim fundamentalism. 
So the, the, the Nazis did that through this uh, Nazi Foreign Secret Service. And they did it so successfully that uh, as part of the motivation, they invited people around and they had their agents in, in these countries. They actually created a mosque. They built, the Nazis built a mosque in Munich. Munich known as the capital of the Nazi movement, at least that's at one stage propaganda claimed that. And, and so they were building a mosque to help as part of this motivation to support the Muslim Brotherhood, which, um, uh, which seemed to you know, have some effect. And so what happened in 1945, when uh, Germany was defeated, um, there was the Nuremberg trial for those um, Nazis who had refused to cooperate and collaborate with the Americans, you see? Um, and what happened with the Nazi International Foreign Secret Service? It was headed by somebody called Galen. It was then known as uh, Operation Galen. Well, that was integrated into the CIA. It became part and parcel of the CIA. And all the assets they continued to run. In fact, that was one of the motivations by the Americans. Well, now we need those assets. We need to be in touch with the, um, the people inside the Soviet Union that we can use to undermine the Soviet Union, be anti-Russian and separatist and so on. The opposition, you see, as President Putin was quoting with Chechnya and so on, where the CIA admitted in their letter to the um, Russian Secret Service, now we will continue to support the opposition, i.e., um, Muslim fundamentalists, extremists, terrorists, um, and also the Nazi movement. Um, so that is what happened. There is a book by an American journalist called A Mosque in Munich, where he tells the story, and it's quite well told, until you come to sort of the end of the Second World War, and then it gets very hazy, and suddenly it's not really an interesting story anymore, it seems, <laughs> to the author. That's when it gets interesting. Uh, because, of course, um, yeah, I mean, these Nazi assets were taken over by the CIA and the CIA continued this work in the Ukraine throughout um, the post-war era. Of course, it had to be quite secret under the Soviet Union, um, but the assets were cultivated and also the same for the Muslim Brotherhood. And that, of course, links back to the Middle East, uh, what's happening in Syria and so on, um, Egypt, um, the British Secret Services have been involved um, and so that's, that's how these things are connected. What in Ukraine? Peace talks. Они были, они были, они дошли до очень высокой стадии согласования позиций, сложных. They had been. They reached a very high stage of coordination of positions in a complex process, but still they were almost finalized. But after we withdrew our troops from Kiev, as I have already said, the other side threw away all these agreements and obeyed the instructions of Western countries, European countries, and the United States to fight Russia to the bitter end. Moreover, the president of Ukraine has legislated a ban on negotiating with Russia. He signed a decree forbidding everyone to negotiate with Russia. But how are we going to negotiate if he forbade himself and everyone to do this? That often is also um, suppressed by the Western press, isn't it? Um, it's, it's illegal uh, to negotiate for peace. Uh, why? Because the Ukrainian president has uh, passed a law that makes it illegal. Um, Maybe that's connected to, you know, this peace negotiator getting shot. Um, I'm not sure about that, but clearly that's the environment that we're operating in. So That he is putting forward some ideas about this settlement. But in order to agree on something, we need to have a dialogue. Is that not right? Well, but you wouldn't be speaking to the Ukrainian president, you'd be speaking to the American president. <laughs> that's a good point, and that's an admission, because of course the Ukrainian president is just a puppet. So yes, thanks, Tucker, you've said it. When was the last time you spoke to Joe Biden? <laughs> now comes an interesting point. Um, now Joe Biden is not known uh, for his pristine 
precise, detailed, deep and uh, long-lasting memory. Um, so, so maybe that, you know, what, what President Putin says is a bit of an allusion to that. I cannot remember when I talked to him. I do not remember. We can look it up. You don't remember? No. Why? Do I have to remember everything? I have my own things to do. We have domestic political affairs. Well, he's funding. <laughs> so, of course, it's a dig. You know, this guy is not important. It's so unimportant. I can't remember when I spoke to him. The war that you're fighting, so I would think that would be memorable. Well, yes, he funds, but I talked to him before the special military operation, of course. And I said to him then, by the way, I will not go into details, I never do, but I said to him then, I believe that you are making a huge mistake of historic proportions by supporting everything that is happening there in Ukraine by pushing Russia away. I told him, told him repeatedly, by the way. I think that would be correct if I stop here. What did he say? Again, he's trying not to break diplomatic, um, you know, sort of code by speaking too much about a, what's considered a confidential discussion with another head of state. But to be frank, I mean, maybe he's too polite. Maybe he, Russians often are too correct um, because, of course, nobody else sticks to these rules so closely. If the West, if the UK, if the US has anything on Putin that maybe comes from such a discussion, they would use it. Um, but he's, you know, he can continues to be very proper. Ask him, please. It is easier for you. You are a citizen of the United States. Go. That is the proper answer. You know, he's not American. It would be sort of meddling in inside America. Why don't you ask your own president? Ask him. It is not appropriate for me to comment on our conversation. But, but, but you haven't spoken to him since before February of 2022. No, we haven't spoken. Certain contacts are being maintained, though. Speaking of which... Of course, this is the between the secret services. Do you remember what I told you about my proposal to work together on a missile defense system? Yes. You can ask all of them. All of them are safe and sound, thank God. The former... Unlike President Biden, you see, the mind is not safe and sound, is what he's saying. But the others, thank God, still have a mind and, and perhaps a bit of a memory, so ask those. President. Condoleezza is safe and sound, and I think Mr. Gates and the current director of the intelligence agency, Mr. Burns, the then ambassador to Russia, in my opinion, are very yes. successful ambassador. They were all witnesses to these conversations. Ask them. Same here. If you are interested in what Mr. President Biden responded to me, ask him. At any rate, I talked to him about it. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely interested, but from the outside, it seems like this could devolve or evolve into something that brings the entire world into conflict and could um, initiate some, a nuclear launch. And so but that's, of course, exactly what President Putin had warned <laughs> the Biden administration and President Biden, um, that this you, is, is a historic mistake, he just said earlier. Why don't you just call Biden? And... <laughs> well, he had told him many times, um, apart from the fact that he's not one, the one who's calling the shots. A, let's work this out. What's there to work out? It's very simple. I repeat, we have contacts through various agencies. I will tell you what we are saying on this matter and what we are conveying to the U.S. leadership. If you really want to stop fighting, you need to stop supplying weapons. It will be over within a few weeks. That's it. And then we can agree on some terms. That's very true, isn't it? The war would end very quickly within two weeks if the warmongers in the West stopped supplying weapons 
and financial support uh, to Ukraine. And so he's saying that's all you need to do is just stop sending weapons and then it'll be over and then we'll have negotiations. Before you do that, stop. What's easier? Why would I call him? What should I talk to him about? Or beg him for what? And, and what messages do you get back? You're going to deliver such and such weapons to Ukraine? Oh, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, please don't. What is there to talk about? Do you think NATO is worth... Of course, he's referring to the fact that the US and the deep state, the CIA, wants this war. And that somehow seems very hard for Tucker Carlson to understand. And they've made this clear to the Russian side that we want this war. So then, yeah. About this becoming a global <clears throat> war or a nuclear conflict? Well, I'm sure Russia is concerned about it and is preparing for it. Uh, but who actively pursues and pushes this war? Well, it's the U.S. side, isn't it? At least that's what they're talking about. And they're trying to intimidate their own population with an imaginary Russian threat. This is an obvious fact. And thinking people, not Philistines, but thinking people, analysts, those who are engaged in real politics, just smart people understand perfectly well that this is a fake. They're trying to fuel the Russian threat. The threat I think you're referring to is a Russian invasion of Poland, Latvia, expansionist behavior. Is, can you imagine a scenario where you sent Russian troops to Poland? Only in one case, if Poland attacks Russia. Why? Because we have no interest in Poland, Latvia or anywhere else. And this is such an important, simple point. So this is actually a very good question by Tucker Carlson. Uh, and, and it's a simple question, but simple questions are often the best ones. Can you imagine ever attacking Poland? Because that's what Russia is being accused of, of wanting to invade. So can you imagine what would be the scenario for you to do that? And President Putin makes it very clear, only if they attack us first, no other reason, no other scenario. Um, and of course, it's very credible that he says that. He's not just telling us a story. Remember, Ukraine became independent and separate by Russia agreeing to it. Russia made it independent and separate. <laughs> what they don't want, of course, is warmongering CIA stationing we uh, nuclear weapons and rockets in Ukraine pointing to Russia. They can't allow that. But that doesn't mean that, you know, it doesn't mean that they want to invade and occupy, um, you know, Eastern Europe, uh, any other country, even Ukraine. They themselves made um, a separate country and it applies to others and I personally believe that I mean I cannot imagine that Russia would attack and invade any country in Germany they're even saying oh some people are saying you're very badly informed or propagandists they're saying no Russia really if we, if we can't stop them in the Ukraine they will invade Germany it's a complete and utter nonsense why would we do that we simply don't have any interest it's just threat mongering well, the argument, I know you know this. In fact, on this point, I'm convinced that if we have a proper government in Germany, Russia would be the one country that would help Germans to finally become independent and sovereign again. Because since 1945, Russian troops have withdrawn from most of Germany, except, you know, Königsberg, uh, they call Kaliningrad, but US troops haven't. You know, there's British troops also still in Germany and the 1945 occupation statutes are still in place. Um, there's the constitution remains suspended um, and we only have a basic law, which is the case for occupied territories. There's no peace treaty. And of course, the CIA loves it. It's one of the CIA's most favorite bases because according to the occupation statutes, whatever illegal criminal stuff they're doing, they feel they can justify by being the occupation power. And so the German government is essentially the administration of the U.S. occupation uh, in Germany. And Russia would be the one country that would support a proper 
sovereign Germany because it's already withdrawn its troops from East Germany. And if one negotiated properly with Russia, I'm convinced they would also withdraw even from Kaliningrad, which would not be popular at home in Russia. But I think everyone would understand and the Russians would look at the history because in, in the past the Russians were never there. Um, and one could turn the, this Königsberg area into a wonderful, peaceful, uh, free trade zone that would turn that area and surrounding areas into boom town, basically, um, an economic um, high growth and high tech zone, free trade, free trade ports and, and all sorts of special features where German um, business, German investment, German technology is infused and Russian cooperation and high quality, very well trained workforce and Russian resources and also technologies uh, would, would be fused and we would get a cooperation between Russia and Germany. But that's of course exactly what um, w you know, we all know. Um, the overarching goal in the 20th century, first for the British, then for the Americans, was to prevent Germany and Russia from cooperating. And you know, that's, that's of course uh, partly also why we have this uh, military action in Ukraine is that, well, he invaded Ukraine, he has territorial aims across the continent, and you're saying unequivocally you don't. It is absolutely out of the question. You just don't have to be any kind of analyst. It goes against common sense to get involved in some kind of a global war. And a global war will bring all humanity to the brink of destruction. It's obvious. There are certainly means of deterrence. They have been scaring everyone with us all along. Tomorrow Russia will use tactical nuclear weapons. Tomorrow Russia will use that. No, the day after tomorrow. So what? in order to extort additional money from U.S. taxpayers and European taxpayers in the confrontation with Russia in the Ukrainian theater of war. The goal is to weaken Russia as much as possible. One of uh, our senior United States senators from the state of New York, Chuck Schumer, said yesterday, I believe, that we have to continue to fund the Ukrainian effort or U.S. soldier citizens could wind up fighting there. How do you assess that? This is a provocation, and a cheap provocation at that. I do not understand why American soldiers should fight in Ukraine. There are mercenaries from the United States there. The bigger number of mercenaries comes from Poland with mercenaries from the United States in second place and mercenaries from Georgia in third place. Well, if somebody has the desire to send regular troops, that would certainly bring humanity to the brink of very serious global conflict. It's very clear. I mean, if there, if there were officially uh, American or British troops um, in Ukraine, this would be like a declaration of war by these countries against Russia, um, if there was then actually a clash between these troops, um, which actually has already happened. I mean, we know there were British troops, um, probably special forces, undercover and whatever. Uh, and there's plenty of videos of um, Americans, uh, officially mercenary, but are they really mercenary or are they actually CIA or CIA subcontractors, um, you know, so, but anyway, President Putin, always correct and, and proper and formal, makes no such accusations at all, um, but is pointing out that if the, you know, officially US troops would be sent, well, that's a declaration of war. This is obvious. Do the United States need this? What for? Thousands of miles away from your national territory. Don't you have anything better to do? 
You have issues on the border, issues with migration, issues with the national debt, more than $33 trillion. You have nothing better to do, so you should fight in Ukraine? Wouldn't it be better to negotiate with Russia, make an agreement, already understanding the situation that is developing today, realizing that Russia will fight for its interests to the end? And realizing this, actually return to common sense, start respecting our country and its interests, and look for certain solutions. It seems to me that this is much smarter and more rational. Who blew up Nord Stream? It's much smarter and more rational to pursue peace, but sadly the West, the warmongers in the US and the UK, very anti-Russian, seem to want war with Russia and can't wait. And of course, the US warmongers also want war with China quite badly, which is very sad. I mean, it means we're run by, by very sick, um, mentally ill people. Okay, now comes the question by Tucker Carlson. Who blew up uh, Nord Stream 2, the pipeline um, delivering? And it's just newly opened. I mean, there, there was an old one, Nord, Nord Stream 1, and right next to it, they built Nord Stream 2 which was another two pipes, so in total four pipe, pipes um, from Russia to deliver through the Baltic Sea to Germany um, gas, natural gas. And of course, as you know, it was blown up, but actually one pipeline survived. Three were badly damaged, one is intact. So the German government could receive the badly needed and very cheap Russian natural gas that is used for for most of the post-war era, but was told by the master, the colonial ruler, the occupation powers in Germany, the United States government, likely through the CIA, you must shut it down. And of course, there have been many statements in the US, even by the president and by many other senior figures and politicians. If they, the Germans really dare to open this Nord Stream to a second set of pipelines from Russia, we will shut it down. We have means to shut it down. We will, trust me, we will shut it down. Just check these videos, plenty out there. So it's almost a rhetorical question when Tucker Carlson asks the president of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin, who blew up that Nord Stream pipeline, the German pipeline of gas from Russia to Germany. Let's hear the answer. <laughs> you for sure. I was busy that day. <laughs> <laughs> Nate, it, do you have, do you have, <laughs> uh, I did not blow up Nord Stream. Uh, <laughs> thank you, though. You personally may have an alibi, but the CIA has no such alibi. So, you did it, you, the CIA, did it, he said to Tucker Carlson. Do, do you have evidence that NATO or the CIA did it? Now, this is where an open, honest answer would, I think, be a straight yes, no doubt. But I think the Russian president wants to, well, they have to protect their sources, basically. And they don't want to show just how much they know in what detail. And sometimes, strategically, they will. Like when, um, when he showed President, was it President Clinton? Um, that the CIA was supporting the terrorist killers that would stage terrorist operations in Chechnya and, and other um, Russian, you know, uh, Federation republics, Muslim terrorist groups would be supported. And he showed the evidence. Um, of course, that was very specifically selected and he disclosed it only to the president. And therefore, I suppose that was still proper. Um, but now he's being asked by a journalist in a public interview. Um, and so I think, yeah, he, he's going to be much cagier. You know, I won't get into details, but people always say in such cases, look for someone who is interested. But in this case... This is the rephrasing of the old Roman saying, cui bono, who is benefiting. It is to whose benefit, then you know who's doing it. We should not only look for someone who is interested, 
but also for someone who has capabilities. Because there may be many people interested, but not all of them are capable of sinking to the bottom of the Baltic Sea and carrying out this explosion. These two components should be connected. Who is interested and who is capable of doing it? But I'm confused. I mean, that's the biggest act. I mean, that certainly narrows it down. <laughs> um, but, I mean, he has said it. He has given a straight answer. Um, the Russian president says it was the CIA. And, of course, many already Western observers um, and other observers, like a Polish uh, senior minister, thank you, USA, showing the picture of things blown up. Industrial terrorism ever. And it's the largest emission of CO2 in, in history. Okay, so if you had evidence... A good point, the largest emission of CO2 in history. Uh, but of course, the climate people, not worried about it. And also, let's have more weapons to Ukraine. Let's blow up more things. Let's have continued warfare. Because in that context, CO2 doesn't matter. It's not an issue. Um, but actually, you should stop driving your car. Uh, you should switch to electric cars, even though we all know that there's not enough electricity for everyone to do that, because actually they want to ration our mobility as they did in 2020, 2021. Um, it's really about restricting our lifestyle, isn't it? Presumably, given your security services, your intel services, you would, that NATO, the US, CIA, the West did this. Why wouldn't you present it and win a propaganda victory? I had that question when I met um, one of the former um, colleagues of uh, Vladimir Putin in Russia and I asked him about one uh, big event, uh, namely 9-11 um, and what, what he knows, what happened and he gave me a similar answer and I, I asked the same um, question as Tucker Carlson asked, you know, what if you have evidence there why wouldn't you? I mean, that's a major PR coup. Let's see. <laughs> In the war of propaganda, it is very difficult to defeat the United States because the United States controls all the world's media and many European media. The ultimate beneficiary of the biggest European media are American financial institutions. Don't you know that? So it is possible to get involved in this work, but it is cost prohibitive, so to speak. We can. S so the, the, the banks, he mentions the banking sector here. US financial institutions are behind the military industrial complex. Um, that also points to the city of London, where um, we have a concentration of very big and powerful banks in a territory that's essentially sovereign territory, not, not part of England, not part of Great Britain, not part of the United Kingdom, but sovereign, um, with powers over Parliament. Um, and, and so it's interesting that he's pointing to the financial sector in response, and they control the media, and therefore it's, this is, you know, you need a lot of resources to match that. Although, of course, you know, this very interview is a low-cost way of fighting back, uh, but it does partly answer the question. Now, I did get a different answer. Um, maybe we'll come back to that. We shine the spotlight on our sources of information and we will not achieve results. That's an important point. If we disclose what we have, we will shine the spotlight on our sources of information, and i.e. We, we reveal how much we know and it's better perhaps to keep them guessing. That's another reason. I still had another reason uh, in response. It is clear to the whole world what happened and yeah. even American analysts talk about it directly. It's true. Yes, I, but, but here's a question you may be able to answer. You worked in Germany, famously. Um, the... He was uh, a KGB officer um, stationed in Germany um, and he was um, in, a, in, a, in a particular town, um, he lived in a, uh, in a, in, there's, a, there's a pub, a restaurant, and they had rooms. He stayed there. He got to know the, um, the, uh, the pub owner. 
And of course, he, he quite liked it. He liked Germany, we know. Uh, his German became very fluent. When I met Vladimir Putin, of course, we were speaking in German. Um, my Russian is basically non-existent and there's no point in um, trying in English with, with somebody who's so fluent in German. Germans clearly know that their NATO partner did this, but they, and it damaged their economy greatly, it may never recover. Very true. So the German economy was so greatly damaged, it may never recover because of course, in addition to blowing up that important pipeline, which is supposed to have doubled the amount of natural gas you can cheaply get from Russia. Instead, um, the instruction came from the US to shut it down and remaining uh, one pipeline also had to be shut down. Um, and you, you have to now buy your, your gas from the US, which is much more expensive and also takes more time. And, um, and so costs have spiraled as a result. Thousands of German companies have gone bankrupt. Um, essentially, Germany is being deindustrialized, um, and um, you know it's a process that other countries have undergone. The, the, this to Britain earlier deindustrialization from the eighties, nineteen eighties onwards. They're doing it to Germany. Um, Japan has been subjected to a massive um, economic warfare by its central bank under U.S. instructions, essentially. Um, so, yeah, you see that Henry Kissinger was quite accurate when he said it's, uh, it's bad to be America's enemy, but it's fatal to be America's ally, to be a friend. That certainly is being applied to Germany. But the reason why this can be done, and this is what Tucker Carlson doesn't seem to know, is because Germany is U.S. occupied and the U.S. is calling the shots. It's a taboo topic. You're not supposed to raise it in Germany. Um, all hell breaks loose. If you do, as I have done in the past in a public place, I've raised the, the issue, speaking to the Bavarian um, um, minister president of Bavaria in a public place. Wow, the reaction was immediate. <laughs> um, they pressed the button for emergency intervention from the outside. <laughs> um, the conversation is certainly stopped, that's for sure. Why are they being silent about it? That's very confusing to me. Why wouldn't the Germans say something about it? <laughs> That's very, very naive. Of course, they're not allowed to. It's a, it's a, they're, not, they're not sovereign. Germany is occupied and you're not even allowed to mention that fact. That is also a taboo. So how can you expect any German government leader to complain to America about what we all know America did to Germany? We're not allowed to mention that millions of German soldiers after 1945, and you know, the ones that survived there, often they were very young soldiers, there were kids being drafted in the last months of the war, and they mostly handed themselves over to the Americans because they, you know, believed all the propaganda, they're dropping leaflets, um, and they heard they're handing out sweets, all sorts, you know, it would be fine with America, Russia, we don't know. Well, my grandfather came back after 10 years in Siberia in a Russian prison of war camp, he came back alive in 1955. And my father told me that he never spoke badly about the Russians. Okay? Whereas those who handed themselves over to the Americans, if they didn't happen to be in a camp where a General Patton was active, in which case they would have been fine, but many were in different camps along the River Rhine um, and they were killed. Millions of soldiers, German soldiers, were killed. The Americans simply classified them as um, enemy, what was it, combatants instead of soldiers, um, disarmed combatants or whatever. They put them in this huge open uh, area without roof, without any housing, without any facilities, with nothing, night and day outside, even in winter. And every day they reduced the rationing, the food. Reduce every day a little bit, you see? Because then they don't realize that they're being starved to death. And in the end, there were skeletons and they died. The local population that tried to bring food, they were shot. There was a death penalty on trying to feed these poor 
often poor kids. Um, and that was several million soldiers. Americans have come forward in recent, in the last 10 years, those who knew about this because they were personally there before they died, as they got old, they wanted to put this on the record. There's some uh, documentaries on it, have a look. This is what uh, was done under Eisenhower. General Patton found out about it, was about to stop it. He had a car accident. Then he survived this car accident. He was, he was recovering in hospital. He got a visit from some other military intelligence people. He was dead. So these are the realities, but you know, obviously Tucker Carlson is somewhat oblivious to these things. This also confuses me. But today's German leadership is guided by the interests of the collective West rather than its national interests. And of course the collective West means the United States of America. Otherwise, it is difficult to explain the logic of their action or inaction. After all, it is not only about Nord Stream 1, which was blown up, and the Nord Stream 2 was damaged. But one pipe is safe and sound, and gas can be supplied to Europe through it. But Germany does not open it. We are ready, please. There is another route through Poland, called Yamal Europe, which also allows for a large flow. Poland has closed it, but Poland packs from the German hand, it receives money from the pan-European funds, and Germany is the main donor to these pan-European funds. Germany has been through the entire, well, since the EU was created, um, has been the biggest net contributor to European funds. Two-thirds of the net contributions are from Germany. Um, Two-thirds of, um, of the European funds are from Germany and, um, and so it's very true what he's saying. So Germany is paying uh, all the other countries and Poland could deliver cheap energy via its pipeline um, from Russia, but it's not. It's closed it. So, so much for good friends. Germany feeds Poland to a certain extent and they closed their route to Germany. Why? I don't understand. Ukraine, to which the Germans supply weapons and give money. Germany is the second sponsor of the... Here many people don't realize that Ukraine continues to receive um, gas from Russia even today. Um, and they could, of course, deliver um, through the pipeline also gas to Germany from Russia, but they're not. So <laughs> Germany gives money and weapons to Poland, to Ukraine, and the Polish and Ukraine cut off Germany, of course, all under U.S. instructions. United States in terms of financial aid to Ukraine. There are two gas routes through Ukraine. They simply closed one route, the Ukrainians. Open the second route and please get gas from Russia. They do not open it. Why don't the Germans say? Look, guys, we give you money and weapons. Open up the valve, please. Let the gas from Russia pass through for us. We're buying liquefied gas at exorbitant prices in Europe, which brings the level of our competitiveness and economy in general down to zero. Do you want us to give you money? Let us have the decent existence. Make money for our economy, because this is where the money we give you comes from. <laughs> it's all very, very true, very insightful and very concisely put um, you know so you see how Germany is being destroyed um, under US instructions telling the Poles telling Ukraine telling German the German government the US uh, occupation administration in Germany itself um, to shut down industry they refuse to do so why <laughs> ask them that is what is like in their heads those are highly incompetent people. Well, maybe the... Well, that's one way of explaining it. It's just incompetence. And it's true that certainly the so-called German government at the moment um, is staffed by some of the most incompetent people you can imagine. Most don't even have a proper school a leaving certificate, let alone a proper um, professional or academic education. But that's not even enough. Mere stupidity cannot explain what's happening in Germany is breaking into two hemispheres 
one with cheap energy, the other without. And I want to ask you that. If, if we're now a multipolar world, obviously we are. Can you describe the blocks of alliances? Who, who is in each side, do you think? It's interesting that uh, President Putin refuses to be drawn into this, uh, even though, of course, Russia is very active among the BRICS countries and uh, also the Shanghai Corporation Organization, this alternative group that Tucker Carlson is now obviously uh, referring to. Listen, you have said that the world is breaking into two hemispheres. A human brain is divided into two hemispheres. One is responsible for one type of activities, the other one is more about creativity and so on. But it is still one and the same head. The world should be a single whole. Security should be shared rather than meant for the golden billion. That is the only scenario where the world could be stable, sustainable and predictable. Until then, while the head is split in two parts, it is an illness, a serious adverse condition. It is a period of severe disease that the world is going through now. But I think that, thanks to honest journalism, this work is akin to work of the doctors. This could somehow be remedied. Well, let's just give one example, the, the US dollar. I think here, uh, President Putin really wanted to, um, again, be what fundamentally Russia has been trying to do, be peacemakers. You know, why do we have to split into two opposing camps? Why do we have to do that? Let's all work together. Yes, it's a multipolar world, but it doesn't mean we have to then create two big camps. Um, I think it's really his message. You know, you don't assume that now has to become antagonistic. Russia has consistently try been trying to avoid that. Which has kind of united the world uh, in a lot of ways, maybe not to your advantage, but certainly to ours. <laughs> Is that going away as the reserve currency, the, the, common, the universally accepted currency, how have sanctions, do you think, changed the dollar's place in the world? You know, to use the dollar as a tool of foreign policy struggle is one of the biggest strategic mistakes made by the U.S. political leadership. The dollar is the cornerstone of the United States power. I think everyone understands very well that no matter how many dollars are printed, they are quickly dispersed all over the world. Inflation in the United States is minimal. It's about 3 or 3.4%, 3 which is, I think, totally acceptable for the U.S. But they won't stop printing. What does the debt of $33 trillion tell us about? It is about the emission. Nevertheless, it is the main weapon used by the United States to preserve its power across the world. As soon as the political leadership decided to use the U.S. dollar as a tool of political struggle, a blow was dealt to this American power. And of course, he's referring to um, the political decision to impound, seize Russian foreign exchange assets, Russian foreign assets, such as U.S. dollar reserves, British pound reserves, euro reserves, uh, Swiss franc reserves and get all the Western governments to freeze those. Um, and now they're talking about handing it out to Ukraine to buy more weapons against Russia. But basically, that means um, you are not, you're not respecting a property uh, law anymore, property rights. You're taking the right to seize somebody's assets because you don't like them or don't like their policies. But the moment you do that, of course, other countries will look at you, oh, that's what you're doing. Hmm, you could suddenly not like our policies and then our money will be taken. And this is exactly what Saudi Arabia and other countries have decided as well. Namely that, oh, wow, okay, we have to get out of the US dollar. That's the end of the dollar as an international, reliable, trustworthy, um, high credibility, 
um, currency and reserve asset. You take that away, which is quite puzzling if you think about it, because that's such a fundamental mistake. Could this really be by accident? And that reminds me of the very beginning of this interview, where several times uh, President Putin said, um, what, how did he put it? For no good reason, or, or uh, for unknown reasons, for unknown reasons, something very peculiar was decided. You know, for unknown reasons, something very peculiar was decided in the U.S., namely to use the U.S. dollar as a political tool, therefore driving away others from the U.S. dollar and therefore dethroning the dollar for unknown reasons. Now, when he used that before, it was because there were particular forces um, at work that had different goals, um, maybe even from what they're supposed to officially um, were supposed to be pursuing, namely the Bolsheviks, and then, you know, making the, creating the Ukraine uh, Socialist Republic and adding some Russian territory to it, making it even bigger, and, and then putting specifically in there, oh, you can leave the Soviet uh, Union of Soviet Republics, the USSR. Um, so, who were these forces? Maybe they were thinking of other things and other goals. Uh, long-term planning, something else in mind. Well, maybe that's also the case with the US dollar. What could those goals be? Well, you see, the United States of America refused to join the League of Nations, which was created in Switzerland as neutral territory by um, internationalists, um, actually very much advanced by Britain. Um, this League of Nations as a um, embryonic world government. That was the goal. And the problem was the US refused to join. Many countries had joined. Uh, Japan had joined. European countries had joined. Germany had joined. Um, Latin America countries had joined. But the United States of America refused to join. Why? We're big. We're powerful. We don't need this. You see, so if you want a world government, then you need to make sure America joins. So next time, the second round was the creation of the United Nations, uh, which was uh, founded at the end of the Second World War, launched uh, right after the Second World War. But basically, the Bretton Woods conferences were the wartime allies rename, renaming themselves United Nations. That already happened before 1945. And, um, and then they, there was land donated to these United Nations by the Rockefellers in Manhattan. That's where the United Nations were then, uh, the, the building was built and was, was all set up. So they made sure America was part of it because this is now done in America and that helped to get support for this. But if you move further and you really want to turn this into a world government, you need to further make sure that America is not going to be against it. But if you want a world government, you want world control, you want a world currency. And if you want a world currency, a world currency, that means it can't be the dollar. I mean, it would be one scenario to try to use the dollar for this, but there's various reasons, uh, for various reasons, that's also not, not easy, uh, certainly at this stage. So the alternative is to have a world currency, but make sure that America joins. But for America to join, the dollar really would have to lose its status as the number one reserve currency. You see, you have to take it down a peg. Uh, you have to take away the attractiveness of the dollar. Then that will allow the establishment of a world currency that is not the dollar, which may be the goal. I would not like to use any strong language, but it is a stupid thing to do and a grave mistake. Look at what is going on in the world. Even the United States allies are now downsizing their dollar reserves. Seeing this, everyone starts looking for ways to protect themselves. But the fact that the United States applies restrictive measures to certain countries such as placing restrictions on transactions, freezing assets, etc., causes great concern and sends a signal to the whole world. What did we have here? 
Until 2022, about 80% of Russian foreign trade transactions were made in US dollars and euros. US dollars accounted for approximately 50% of our transactions with third countries. Well, currently it is down to 13%. It wasn't us who banned the use of the US dollar. So it's happening. The US dollar, uh, of course, was the currency of choice for a commodities trade. Russia is a, is a top commodities exporter, raw material exporter, energy exporter. And that used to be denominated in US dollars. And you're saying half of the trade with third countries was in US dollars. Now it's only 13%. And that's not because of Russia's decision, but because of America's decision, which is quite surprising. Inexplicably, for unknown reasons, America wanted this to happen, or some people uh, involved in America, influential America, wanted this to happen. Um, and of course, it's been quite dramatic how the, um, the biggest oil producer in the world, Saudi Arabia, has uh, broken the old agreement on which the petrol dollar was based. Namely, that all the oil exported from Saudi Arabia will be sold only in US dollars. Um, that was how the dollar was rescued after the United States uh, defaulted on its uh, gold conversion promise, its gold conversion obligations. It defaulted on in August 1971, quite famously, when uh, President Richard Nixon gave that. A speech on television, which you can see on YouTube, um, that uh, he was going to temporarily suspend the convertibility of the dollar into gold, temporarily been in place for, um, that inconvertibility has been in place for uh, more than half a century. Um, and of course the dollar fell and fell. And to stabilize it, two things happened. Number one, the uh, Federal Reserve instructed the allies, uh, i.e. Uh, vassal states, uh, that their central banks would have to print a lot of money to weaken their currency. So in relative terms, that supports the dollar. Uh, so that's why we had the 1970s inflation. It was not an oil shock that came later. Um, it was not raw material and war and raw material price rises. No, it was simply the central banks printing a whole lot of money. And secondly, only then, in 1974, first uh, yeah, January 74, uh, Kiss Henry Kissinger arm twisted the Saudi Arabian oil minister to. Um, well, first of all, they had an agreement in place in late 73 that oil will only be sold against US dollar, but then he persuaded the oil minister to quadruple the price of the dollar. That happened later. The inflation had already peaked, then the oil price quadrupled. So, the oil price quadrupling was not the cause of the inflation. It was the central bank massive, massive money printing in 1971 and 72. Because there's a lead time. That explains the 1973 inflation, not the 74 quadrupling of the oil price that came too late. And in fact, it's been the same in 2020. So we are back to a scenario where we're shifting. First, we shifted from the... Um, from the gold dollar to the petrol dollar, and now we're shifting from the petrol dollar to the new standard. Um, and I think they want to, to move to CBDCs. We're, we're in between, it's a process. Um, and, and ideally, the, I think the goal is to move to this world currency, but for that you have to take down the, the usage of the dollar. Um, now Saudi Arabia is selling oil against uh, the Chinese currency, and it's it's staunchly now in the camp of the BRICS countries, this bifurcation of the world economy that Carl, uh, Tucker Carlson did mention, and which President Putin thinks is a bad thing, that this unfortunately is, is now happening. He's trying to avoid it. Um, so I think that is the background. We had no such intention. It was decision of the United States to restrict our transactions in US dollars. I think it is complete foolishness from the point of view of the interests of the United States itself and its taxpayers, as it damages the U.S. economy, undermines the power of the United States across the world. And that is very true. You see, that's the price to pay 
by those who want a world government and maybe they're not loyal to the US, maybe they aren't even mainly US citizens, um, because the US will also have to pay for this. Uh, as President Putin has quite correctly and quite astutely analyzed here just now. By the way, our transactions in yuan accounted for about 3%. Today, 34% of our transactions are made in wow. rubles. And about so there's more, more than 10 times expansion of the share of uh, Chinese currency transactions from 3 to 34%. As much, a little over 34% in yuan. Why did the United States do this? My only guess is self-conceit. Well, so he's guessing, i.e. it's an error. Well, that's the, um, the coincidence theory of history, the error history, the error theory of history. Uh, when really uh, economists assume rationality and uh, deliberation and deliberate actions, so um, we have to at least consider that as a possibility as well. We thought it would lead need... to full collapse, but nothing collapsed. Moreover, other countries, including oil producers, are thinking of and already accepting payments for oil in yuan. Do you even realize what is going on or not? Does anyone in the United States realize this? What are you doing? You are cutting yourself off. All experts say this. Ask any intelligent and thinking person in the United States what the dollar means for the U.S. But You're killing it with your own hands. I think that's a fact. Yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a pretty good quote. You're killing the dollar with your own hands, and that's what the U.S. is doing. And I think that's, it, that's such a, a big issue. One has to ask, why is this happening? Who's really behind this? And my explanation you just heard, um, I think it's towards this greater goal of moving towards uh, a world government and world currency, which is something that's not very good because concentration of power is always bad. Um, I'm, a, I'm a strong supporter of decentralization in every east, uh, aspect, economically, politically. Decentralization is, is superior in terms of outcomes and also quality of life and motivation of people, everything is better. If you delegate powers and decision-making to the lowest possible level uh, and empower people, educate people so they can make decisions for their lives, that's really what we want. Anything else, and particularly the opposite of total centralized control is just repulsive and disastrous. Um, but it is very much desired by some people that love power and they want to concentrate it further, and we've had it throughout history, of course, these attempts to do that. I think it's a fair assessment. The question is what comes next, and maybe you trade one colonial power for another much less sentimental and forgiving colonial power. I mean, are, is the, the, the BRICS, for example, in danger of being completely dominated by the Chinese, the Chinese economy, uh, in a way that's not good for their sovereignty? Here, Tucker Carlson, who earlier said that, oh, nobody in America is, is afraid of China, hmm. shows that he, as an American, seems a bit afraid of China because he says, oh, you, you could be trading, you know, the, 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 the rule from one being un, uh, ruled by one uh, former colonial power, uh, the U.S., uh, trade that in for another one being ruled by, uh, ruled by the Chinese, who are much less forgiving. Well, I don't think that's actually a correct assessment um, of, of the Chinese uh, international economic and, and foreign policy. Do you worry about that? <laughs> well, we have heard those boogeyman stories before. It is a boogeyman story. We're neighbors with China. You cannot choose neighbors just as you cannot choose close relatives. We share a border of 1,000 kilometers with them. This is number one. Second. And so he knows, well, they don't attack. They are friendly neighbors. Um, they get along. There's no problem. So why are you stirring things up? That's really what he's saying here. We have a centuries-long history of coexistence. We're used to it. Third, China's foreign policy philosophy is not aggressive. 
Its idea is to always look for compromise, and we can see that. Exactly, that's the record. It's very, very clear. Uh, China does not have 1,000 overseas military bases. Um, it does not pay for secret service agents with a so-called license to kill. Uh, it is still illegal, but um, they don't care. Um, and, and is assassinating people and, and assassinating leaders in various countries, arranging for so-called regime change. China is not doing that. So, um, you know, if we need to be afraid of a country doing that, I think it's the US. The next point is as follows. We're always told the same boogeyman story. And here it goes again, through an euphemistic form, but it is still the same boogeyman story. The cooperation with China keeps increasing. The pace at which China's cooperation with Europe is growing is higher and greater than that of the growth of Chinese-Russian cooperation. Ask Europeans, aren't they afraid? They might be, I don't know. But they are still trying to access China's market at all costs, especially now that they are facing economic problems. Chinese businesses are also exploring the European market. Do Chinese businesses have small presence in the United States? Yes, the political decisions are such that they are trying to limit their cooperation with China. It is to your own detriment, Mr. Tucker, that you are limiting cooperation with China. You are hurting yourself. It is a delicate matter, and there are no silver bullet solutions, just as it is with the dollar. So, before introducing any illegitimate sanctions, illegitimate in terms of the Charter of the United Nations, one should think very carefully. For decision makers, this appears to be a problem. So you said a moment ago that the world would be a lot better if it weren't broken into competing alliances, if there was cooperation globally. Well, one of the reasons you don't have that is because the current American administration is dead set against you. Do you think if there were a new administration after Joe Biden that you would be able to reestablish communication with the US government? Or does it not matter who the president is? I will tell you, but let me finish the previous thought. We, together with my colleague and friend, President Xi Jinping, set a goal to reach $200 billion of mutual trade with China this year. We have exceeded this level. According to our... Again, uh, Putin is in charge of this interview, isn't he? he? He hadn't quite made all his points on China, so he's not yet allowing the, the new question. Figures, our bilateral trade with China totals already 230 billion, and the Chinese statistics says it is 240 billion dollars. One more important thing. Our trade is well balanced, mutually complementary in high tech, energy, scientific research and development. It is very balanced. As for BRICS, where Russia took over the presidency this year, the BRICS countries are by and large developing very rapidly. Look, if memory serves me right, back in 1992, the share of the G7 countries in the world economy amounted to 47%, whereas in 2022, it was down to, I think, a little over 30%. The BRICS countries accounted for only 16% in 1992, but now their share is greater than that of the G7. It has nothing to do with the events in Ukraine. This is due to the trends of global development and world economy, as I mentioned just now. And this is inevitable. This will keep happening. It is like the rise of the sun. You cannot prevent the sun from rising. You have to adapt to it. How do the United States adapt? With the help of force, sanctions, pressure, bombings, and use of armed forces. This is about self-conceit. Your political establishment does not understand that the world is changing under objective circumstances. And in order to preserve your level, 
even if someone aspires, pardon me, to the level of dominance, you have to make the right decisions in a competent and timely manner. Such brutal actions, including with regard to Russia and, say, other countries, are counterproductive. This is an obvious fact. It has already become evident. So he's saying, even with its um, CIA-run uh, foreign policy, which is all about you know, uh, intimidating countries, bombing countries, the bits, uh, creating war strife, supporting terrorist groups, creating terrorist groups from scratch and supporting them and uh, in order to undermine uh, governments. This policy is outdated and will not no longer be successful, uh, he's saying. And partly, of course, people are now finally seeing through this uh, it's quite disastrous policy. You just asked me if another leader comes and changes something. It is not about the leader. It is not about the personality of a particular person. I had a very good relationship with, uh, say, Bush. I know that in the United States, he was portrayed as some kind of a country boy who does not understand much. I assure you that this is not the case. I think he made a lot of mistakes with regard to Russia, too. I told you about 2008 and the decision in Bucharest to open the NATO's doors to for Ukraine and so on. That happened during his presidency. He actually exercised pressure on the Europeans. But in general, on a personal human level, I had a very good relationship with him. He was no worse than any other American or Russian or European politician. I assure you, he understood what he was doing as well as others. I had such personal relationship with Trump as well. It is not about the personality of the leader. It is about the elite's mindset. If the idea of domination at any cost, based also on forceful actions, dominates the American society, nothing will change. It will only get worse. But if, in the end, one comes to the awareness that the world has been changing due to the objective circumstances, and that one should be able to adapt to them in time, using the advantages that the U.S. still has today, then perhaps something may change. Look, China's economy has become the first economy in the world in purchasing power parity. In terms of volume, it overtook the U.S. a long time ago. The USA comes second, then India, one and a half billion people, and then Japan, with Russia in the fifth place. Russia was the first economy in Europe last year, despite all the sanctions and restrictions. Is it normal from your point of view? Sanctions, restrictions, impossibility of payments in dollars, being cut off from SWIFT services, sanctions against our ships carrying oil, sanctions against airplanes, sanctions in everything, everywhere. The largest number of sanctions in the world which are applied are applied against Russia. And we have become Europe's first economy during this time. That's something I warned about already in 2000, uh, I think 15, I wrote an article actually co-authored with uh, uh, Professor um, Vladimir Yak Yakunin, who was the former uh, president of Russian Railways, um, and I mean, I, 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 you know, I, I created the first draft, and he contributed ideas. Um, and in this article, we argue that um, these sanctions that were beginning to be imposed from 2014, because Russia took annexed uh, the Crim Peninsula, Crimea Peninsula. Well, actually, it was based on a referendum and, and so on. You've heard the background. Um, but these sanctions will actually strengthen the Russian economy, was our main argument. And they're a good thing for Russia. Um, Russia will be fine with this uh, because previously it was mainly focused on exporting raw materials. That's not a good strategy for any country because your terms of trade don't improve. 
uh, you get very little of benefit from international trade. You need to upgrade, upscale, have more higher value added activities. And the sanctions will force Russia to do that, import substitution, um, not just in the high-tech industries and so on, but also intermediate and even low-tech, even agriculture. They started to, you know, they couldn't get French cheese anymore. Well, Russian cheesemakers uh, developed, were created for the first time, and, and, and. So, you know, all this import substitution um, created a much more balanced economy that wasn't just dependent on raw material exports. And therefore, Russia has benefited really quite a lot. Um, and that continued, of course, with the sanctions in, in recent uh, couple of years getting str stricter and stricter. Now the most, the strictest sanctions of any country in the world, on any country in the world. Um, and Russia is the outperforming economy in Europe. It's exactly my analysis. Um, Proven. The tools that U.S. uses don't work. Well, one has to think about what to do. If this realization comes to the ruling elites, then yes, then the first person of the state will act in anticipation of what the voters and the people who make decisions at various levels expect from this person. Then maybe something will change. But you're describing two different systems. You say that the leader acts in the interest of the voters, but you also say these decisions are not made by the leader, they're made by the ruling classes. <clears throat> You've run this country for so long, you known all these American presidents, what are those power centers in the United States, do you think? Like, who actually makes the decisions? I don't think he's going to answer this in detail, uh, but let's listen. I don't know. America is a complex country, conservative on one hand, rapidly changing on the other. It's not easy for us to sort it all out. <laughs> It's not easy for us Russians to tell you, American, how America works, okay? Actually, he could give you a straight answer, but he clearly, um, he, again, doesn't think it's proper. I mean, he's the president of Russia, and he thinks, you know, the, the Russians support this non-interference principle. He shouldn't get involved in uh, domestic politics issues in America. Um, because likewise, he doesn't want Americans to constantly, as they do, get involved in you know, domestic Russian matters, as they do. But of course, the Russians always say, no, stop that, don't do that, we don't do that. And likewise, therefore, he doesn't want to do what the Americans always do, get involved in domestic matters of other countries. That, I think, is, is the, reason, the main reason. So you'd have to meet him personally in private, totally off the record. He would give you your analysis, I'm sure. Who makes decisions in the elections? Is it possible to understand this when each state has its own legislation? Each state regulates itself? Someone can be excluded from elections at the state level. Yeah, Trump can be excluded, elections can be rigged, and so on. It is a two-stage electoral system. It is very difficult for us to understand it. Because it's, it's simpler and more direct in Russia, actually, perhaps more democratic. Certainly, there are two parties that are dominant, the Republicans and the Democrats. And within this party system, the centers that make decisions, that prepare decisions. Then, look, why, in my opinion, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, such an erroneous, crude, completely unjustified policy of pressure was pursued against Russia? After all, this is a policy of pressure. NATO expansion, support for the separatists in Caucasus, creation of a missile defense system. These are all elements of pressure. Pressure, pressure, pressure. A very aggressive anti-Russian policy consistently pursued and particularly pushed in Europe by the UK, but, uh, but NATO leader, uh, the US. Then dragging Ukraine into NATO is all about pressure, pressure, pressure. Why? I think, among other things, because excessive production capacities were created. During the confrontation with the Soviet Union, there were many centers created and specialists on the Soviet Union who could not do anything else. 
They convince the political leadership that it is necessary to continue chiseling Russia, to try to break it up, to create on this territory several quasi-state entities and to subdue them in a divided form, to use their combined potential for the future struggle with China. This is a mistake, including the excessive potential of those who worked for the confrontation with the Soviet Union. It is necessary to get rid of this. There should be new, fresh forces, people who look into the future and understand what is happening in the world. Look at how Indonesia is developing. 600 million people. Where can we get away from that? Nowhere. We just have to assume that Indonesia will enter it is already in the club of the world's leading economies, no matter who likes it or dislikes it. Yes, we understand and are aware that in the United States, despite all the economic problems, the situation is still normal with the economy growing decently. The GDP is growing by 2.5%, if I'm not mistaken. But if we want to ensure the future, then we need to change our approach to what is changing. As I already said, the world would nevertheless change, regardless of how the developments in Ukraine end. The world is changing. In the United States themselves, experts are writing that the United States are nonetheless gradually changing their position in the world. It is your experts who write that. I just read them. The only question is how this would happen painfully and quickly, or gently and gradually. And this is written by people who are not anti-American. They simply follow global development trends. That's it. And in order to assess them and change policies, we need people who think, look forward, can analyze and recommend certain decisions at the level of political leaders. I just have to ask, you've said clearly that NATO expansion <coughs> eastward is a violation of the promise you all were made in 1990. <coughs> it, it's a threat to your country. Right before you sent troops into Ukraine, the Vice President of the United States went to the Munich Security Conference and encouraged the President of Ukraine to join NATO. Do you think that was an effort to provoke you into military action? <sighs> I repeat once again, we have repeatedly, repeatedly proposed to seek a solution to the problems that arose in Ukraine after 2014 coup d'etat through peaceful means. But no one listened to us. And moreover, the Ukrainian leaders who were under the complete U.S. control suddenly declared that they would not comply with the Minsk agreements. They disliked everything there and continued military activity in that territory. And in parallel, that territory was being exploited by NATO military structures under the guise of various personnel training and retraining centers. So here he's hinting a bit more at the clandestine activities that have been going on in Ukraine. He uh, hasn't mentioned the bio labs, um, which you know are connected to um, you know viruses like um, and so on. Uh, but you know clandestine activities, um, military installations, essentially of NATO, which you know is. Um, is quite a dangerous thing because the Russians could interpret this as, a, as an act of war. They essentially began to create bases there. That's all. Ukraine announced that the Russians were a non-titular nationality while passing the laws that limit the rights of non-titular nationalities in Ukraine. Ukraine having... So discrimination against ethnic Russians, um, ethnic Russian Ukrainians, you know, a Ukrainian passport, living in Ukraine, um, and of course that was a, a key trigger. ...received all these southeastern territories as a gift from the Russian people, suddenly announced that the Russians were a non-titular nationality in that territory. So the point here is that it was the Russians that gave that territory to Ukraine, you know, this is done by, the, uh, by Stalin, um, and then, and that includes lots of Russians, millions of Russians, and then suddenly Ukraine saying, oh, well, now we will actually 
make them second class citizens, but we're happy to have the land. Is that normal? All this put together led to the decision to end the war that neo Nazis started in Ukraine in 2014. So that's the key, of course, from a Russian perspective. The war started in 2014, uh, run by neo Nazis against Ukrainian citizens of Russian ethnicity, um, you know, Russian, Russian speakers. Do you, do you think Zelensky has the freedom to negotiate a settlement <clears throat> to this conflict? That's quite a pertinent question. I think the answer has to be no. And the example should be given of Boris Johnson turning up when President uh, Putin's people were about to sign a deal with uh, the Ukraine leadership in March 22. I don't know the details, of course, it's difficult for me to judge. But I believe he has, in any case, he used to have. His father <laughs> fought against the fascists. Okay, so maybe he's, um, again, he's so careful that nobody can accuse him of being uh, just, you know, uh, anti-Ukrainian or he doesn't like the Ukrainian president and things like that. So he's, I think, out of his way being super correct, doesn't even want to say anything negative about um, the power position of, of Zelensky. Nazis during World War II pointing out the contradictions, like his father was f fighting against the Nazis in, in World War II. Let's talk to him about this. I said, Volodya, what are you doing? Why are you supporting neo-Nazis in Ukraine today, while your father fought against fascism? He was a frontline soldier. I will not tell you what he answered. This is a separate topic, and I think... Again, because it was a private, well, so to speak, conversation, um, he's not breaching confidentiality. I mean, one could, one could say, I mean, if two heads of state talk, that it is a matter of pub public interest, what they're saying. Um, but, you know, he doesn't want to be the one breaking that confidentiality, particularly perhaps now. You see, he is really actively keeping the door open for President Zelensky to reach out to him, you know, because he's not throwing him under the bus. He's not. Uh, and, and probably he's aware that Zelensky is under pressure from the neo-Nazi uh, groups in particular. And also we're reaching a critical stage where uh, Ukrainian military is just not making any progress. They're constantly retreating. The Russians are uh, gaining the territory that they always said from the beginning they only want to secure and uh, bring peace to pacify so something could happen um, with Zelensky in the end and I think he's leaving the door and come to Russia you'll be safe or you know just negotiate um, peace with us I think he wants to encourage him you have the power you can do it <laughs> of course you have to have a spine and you have to stand up to your American controllers and whether that's going to happen is another question incorrect for me to do so but that's to the... See, he's very, very correct. He wouldn't want to uh, speak about this conversation. Being freedom of choice, why not? He came to power on the expectations of Ukrainian people that he would lead Ukraine to peace. He talked. Which is true. That was his um, election time promise. We'll keep peace. We'll have peace with, uh, with Russia and with uh, the Russian-speaking population. But he broke that promise. Of this... It was thanks to this that he won the elections overwhelmingly. But then, when he came to power, in my opinion, he realized two things. Firstly, it is better not to clash with neo-Nazis and nationalists, because they are aggressive and very active. You can expect anything from them. And secondly, the US-led West supports them and will always support those who antagonize with Russia. It is beneficial and safe. So he took the relevant position despite promising his people to end the war in Ukraine. He deceived his voters. But do you think at this point, as of February 2024, he has the latitude, the freedom to speak with you or your government directly about putting an end to this, which clearly isn't helping his country or the world? Can he do that, do you think? 
Ну, а почему нет? Он же He considers himself head of state. He won the elections. Although we believe in Russia that the coup d'etat is the primary source of power for everything that happened after 2014. And in this sense, even today, government is flawed. But he considers himself the president and he is recognized by the United States, all of Europe and practically the rest of the world in such a capacity. Why not? He can. Of course, there's a bit of irony here, you know, basically saying, well, President Zelensky considers himself to be the president and all your propaganda media are claim proclaiming him to be president, so why can't he negotiate peace with me? <laughs> We negotiated with Ukraine in Istanbul. We agreed. He was aware of this. Moreover, the negotiation group leader, Mr. Arakamiya is his last name, I believe still has the faction of the ruling party, the party of the president in the Rada. He still has the presidential faction in the Rada, the country's parliament. He still sits there. He even put his preliminary signature on the document I am telling you about. But then he publicly stated to the whole world, we were ready to sign this document, but Mr. Johnson, then the Prime Minister of Great Britain, came and dissuaded us from doing this, saying it was better to fight Russia. They would give everything needed for us to return what was lost during the clashes with Russia. And so once again, a British promise, just like the British promise to Poland not to negotiate with Germany and come to a peaceful settlement so that the uh, Eastern Prussian, East German territories would actually have a physical road connecting them to the rest of Germany. That's what Hitler was asking for. Uh, but no, Britain told Poland, don't, don't negotiate. And again, Britain told Ukraine, don't make peace with Russia. It's better to have hundreds of thousands of your sons killed on the battlefield. We agreed with this proposal. Look, his statement has been published. He said it publicly. Can they return to this or not? The question is, do they want it or not? Further on, President of Ukraine issued a decree prohibiting negotiations with us. Let him cancel that decree, and that's it. We have never refused negotiations, indeed. We hear all the time, is Russia ready? Yes, we have not refused. It was them who publicly refused. Well, let him cancel his decree and enter into negotiations. We have never refused. Yeah, so basically it's the, um, the Ukrainian regime that uh, painted itself into a corner there um, and the US handlers let them sort it out. Russia was always open to negotiation, in fact, always engaged in negotiations. They were just always tricked by these dishonest negotiations, but they're still ready to negotiate. And the fact that they obeyed the demand or persuasion of Mr. Johnson, the former Prime Minister of Great Britain, seems ridiculous and very sad to me. Exactly. I mean, how is it even possible that this British person could suddenly have so much power that hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians have to die uh, on the battlefield for nothing um, and ultimately there will anyway there will be some negotiated solution that could have been possible already at the outset and actually ironically uh, Russia will gain in inverted commas more now than what Russia offered initially when all its offers were turned down um, you know the Ukraine is likely to be smaller um, when, when there is the final uh, peace uh, agreement. So how come the British always have this power to intervene and, and people are listening to it? That's an interesting question. Arakamiya put it, we could have stopped those hostilities with war a year and a half ago already. But the British persuaded us and we refused this. Where is Mr. Johnson now? And the war continues. That's a where is he now? And the war continues, yeah. Like, who is this guy? Well, he was just another stooge, so who is he working for? Who are these real decision makers? Question. Where do you think he is and why did he do that? 
Hell knows. I don't understand it myself. There was a general starting point. For some reason, everyone had the illusion that Russia could be defeated on the battlefield. Because of arrogance, because of a pure heart, but not because of a great mind. <laughs> because of arrogance, maybe? Or did they do it because of a pure heart or just a sincere conviction of something? Um, well, maybe, but it certainly wasn't because of competence and intelligence. You've described uh, the connection between Russia and Ukraine. You've described Russia itself a couple of times as orthodox. That's central to your understanding of Russia. You said you're orthodox. What does that mean in, for you? You're a Christian leader by your own description. So what effect does that have on you? So the topic is being turned to religion and the fact that the Russian president is is a Christian, a Christian leader that supports the Christian church and is publicly going into church and so on. And of course, that would be an opportunity to appeal to Americans, which, you know, I mean, the majority in, in Midwestern America is Christian. Um, let's see what, what President Putin makes of this. Uh, you know... As I already mentioned in 988, Prince Vladimir himself was baptized following the example of his grandmother, Princess Olga. And then he baptized his squad. And then gradually over the course of several years, he baptized all the Rus. It was a lengthy process from pagans to Christians. It took many years. But in the end, this orthodoxy, Eastern Christianity, deeply rooted itself in the consciousness of the Russian people. When Russia expanded and absorbed other nations who profess Islam, Buddhism and Judaism, Russia has always been very loyal to those people who profess other religions. This is her strength. This is absolutely clear. And the fact is that the main postulates, main values are very similar, not to say the same in all world religions I've just mentioned, and which are the traditional religions of the Russian Federation, Russia. Right, so he, here we realize that as a president of the Russian Federation, he has to be careful and cannot, um, he cannot uh, talk too much about just the Christian faith. Uh, of course, in the context of history and, uh, you know, the development of the separate Ukraine and so on and Poland, uh, you know, religion is relevant. He mentioned the Christian religion. <clears throat> but of course, as president, he has to be aware there's many Muslims and um, people of other religions as well. So I think that's why he's a bit um, um, less gung-ho about talking about just Christianity. By the way, Russian authorities were always very careful about the culture and religion of those people who came into the Russian Empire. This, in my opinion, forms the basis of both security and stability of the Russian statehood. All the peoples inhabiting Russia basically consider it their motherhood. They say people move over to you or to Europe from Latin America. An even clearer and more understandable example, people come but yet they have come to you or to European countries from their historical homeland. And people who profess different religions in Russia consider Russia their motherland. They have no other motherland. We are together. This is one big family and our traditional values are very similar. I've just mentioned one big family, but everyone has his, her own family. And this is the basis of our society. And if we say that the motherland and the family are specifically connected with each other, it is indeed the case, since it is impossible to ensure a normal future for our children and our families unless we ensure a normal, sustainable future for the entire country. 
for the motherland. That is why patriotic sentiment is so strong in Russia. So he, instead of talking about a particular religion, he actually diverted the conversation to the importance of, um, of families and also the importance of having you know, a strong country, um, borders protected to protect families, and, and families are important for, he said it, children. And of course we are talking about the traditional family here, which does get supported very much in Russia, whereas in Western countries um, all sorts of policies are put in place to undermine the family, um, and it's, it's often uh, not supported, to put it mildly. But the, the one way in which the religions are different is that Christianity is specifically a nonviolent religion. Jesus says, turn the other cheek, don't kill. How can a leader who has to kill of any country, how can a leader be a Christian? How do you reconcile that? Well, I mean, it's kind of unfair to ask the Russian president that question when, um, of course, um, the British military throughout the British Empire, you know, was carrying uh, the cross and, and had military priests um, justifying the military action. I mean, in India, under British uh, rule over the centuries, literally millions of people were killed, partly by British weapons, partly by British economic policies of starvation and famine and destruction of uh, the most advanced industries such as textile in some areas but just because they were ahead of British textile and better quality and cheaper and so on. So um, that was all sanctioned by the hired priests um, and certainly you know that's also a question he needs to ask the American leaders that um, in their speeches also you know uh, speak about God and, and God bless America and so on. Um, but of course their foreign policy run by the CIA is anything but godly. It is very easy when it comes to protecting oneself and one's family, one's homeland. We won't attack anyone. Good thing, he says it so clearly, uh, contradicting the propaganda in Western mainstream media. Russia is going to attack us and invade us. We will not attack anyone. Exactly. When did the developments in Ukraine start? Since the coup d'etat and the hostilities in Donbas began, that's when they started. And we're protecting our people, ourselves, our homeland and our future. So it's a defensive war and that's exactly why the Western media will always say, oh, the, uh, the war of aggression by Russia, the war of the all-out invasion, when it's neither an all-out invasion very clearly. Um, I mean, they've been very careful. Uh, they haven't done any of the American and British style carpet bombing of the population. Um, that is, is actually done in the Middle East at the moment as well. But the Russians have not done that. As for religion in general, you know, it's not about external manifestations. It's not about going to church every day or banging your head on the floor. It is in the heart. And our culture is so human oriented. Dostoevsky, who was very well known in the West and the genius of Russian culture, Russian literature, spoke a lot about this, about the Russian soul. After all, Western society is more pragmatic. Russian people think more about the eternal, about moral values. I don't know, maybe you won't agree with me, but Western culture is more pragmatic after all. I'm not saying this is bad. It makes it possible for today's golden billion to achieve good success in production, even in science and so on. 
There's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying that we kind of look the same. But our well, so, minds so do you see the different. supernatural at work as you look out across what's happening in the world now? Do you see God at work? Do you ever think to yourself, these are forces that are not human? Well, God with a small g, the prince of the world, uh, clearly is in charge, uh, which you know is, is also known as Lucifer or Satan. Uh, that is the, the, the God with a small g uh, of the world. So slightly strange or very naive or uninformed question, I would say. No, to be honest. I don't think so. My opinion is that the development of the world community is in accordance with the inherent laws. And those laws are what they are. It's always been this way in the history of mankind. Some nations and countries rose, became stronger and more numerous, and then left the international stage, losing the status they had accustomed to. There is probably no need for me to give examples, but we could start with the Genghis Khan and Horde Conquerors, the Golden Horde, and then end with the Roman Empire. It seems that there has never been anything like the Roman Empire in the history of mankind. Nevertheless, the potential of the barbarians gradually grew, as did their population. In general, the barbarians were getting stronger and began to develop economically, as we would say today. This eventually led to the collapse of the Roman Empire and the regime imposed by the Romans. However, it took five centuries for the Roman Empire to fall apart. The difference with what is happening now is that all the processes of change are happening at the much faster pace than in Roman times. In other words, the collapse of the US dominance and the US empire is going to be much faster than the collapse of the Roman Empire, which took place over centuries. So here we're talking probably not even decades, but years. So when does the AI empire start, do you think? <laughs> <laughs> you are asking increasingly more complicated questions. To answer them, you need to be an expert in big numbers, big data and AI. Mankind is currently facing many threats. Due to the genetic researches, it is now possible to create a superhuman, a specialized human being a genetically engineered athlete, scientist, military man. There are reports that Elon Musk had already had a chip implanted in the human brain in the USA. What do you think of that? Well, I think there's no stopping Elon Musk. He will do as he sees fit. Nevertheless, you need to find some common ground with him, search for ways to persuade him. I think he's a smart person, I truly believe he is. So you need to reach an agreement with him because this process needs to be formalized and subjected to certain rules. So, there should be. so he has concerns about um, physical implants, transhumanism, you know, um, and of course, that's not surprising because he's much more conservative, traditional, um, and also, you know, supports Christian ethical values. Humanity has to consider what is going to happen due to the newest development in genetics or in AI. One can make an approximate prediction of what will happen. 
Once mankind felt an existential threat coming from nuclear weapons, all nuclear nations began to come to terms with one another since they realized the negligent use of nuclear weaponry could drive humanity to extinction. It is impossible to stop research in genetics or AI today, just as it was impossible to stop the use of gunpowder back in the day. But as soon as we realize that the threat comes from unbridled and uncontrolled development of AI, or genetics, or any other field, the time will come to reach an international agreement on how to regulate these things. I, I appreciate all the time uh, you've given us. I just going to ask you one last question, and that's about someone who's very famous in the United States, probably not here, Evan Gershkovitz, who's the Wall Street Journal reporter. He's 32, um, and he's been in prison for almost a year. Uh, this is a huge story in the United States, and I just want to ask you directly, without getting into the details of it or your version of what happened, if as a sign of your decency, you would be willing to release him to us and we'll bring him back to the United States. We have done so many gestures of goodwill out of decency that I think we have run out of them. We have never seen anyone reciprocate to us in a similar manner. However, in theory, we can say that we do not rule out that we can do that if our partners take reciprocal steps. When I talk about the partners, I first of all refer to special services. Special services are in contact with one another. They are talking about the matter in question. There is no taboo to settle this issue. We are willing to solve it. But there are certain terms being discussed via special services channels. I believe an agreement can be reached. So typically, I mean, this stuff has happened for obviously centuries. One country catches under spy within its borders, it trades it for one of its own intel guys in another country. I think what makes this, and it's not my business, but what makes this difference is the guy's obviously not a spy, he's a kid. And maybe he was breaking your law in some way, but he's not a super spy and everybody knows that. And he's being held hostage in exchange, which is true. With respect, it's true and everyone knows it's true. Everyone knows that he's not a spy, except uh, he was caught spying. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, slightly naive of, of Tucker Carlson. Um, I mean, I encountered quite a few um, basically CIA guys under their day job cover of journalists for American newspapers and so on. So, so maybe he's in a different category. Maybe it's not fair to ask for, you know, somebody else in exchange for letting him out. Maybe it degrades Russia to do that. You know, you can give different interpretations. They use the German word for spy, spion in Russian. What constitutes a spy? But there are certain things provided by law. If person gets secret information and does that in a conspiratorial manner, then this is a qualified as espionage. And that is exactly what he was doing. He was receiving classified confidential information and he did it covertly. Maybe he did that out of carelessness or his own initiative. Considering the sheer fact that this is qualified as espionage, the fact has been proven as he was caught red-handed when he was receiving this information. If it had been some far-fetched excuse, some fabrication, something not proven, it would have been a different story then. But he was caught red-handed when he was secretly getting confidential information. What is it then? But are you suggesting that he was working for the US government or NATO, or he was just a reporter who was given material he wasn't supposed to have? Those seem like very different very different things. I don't know who he worked 
I don't know who he was working for, but I would like to reiterate that getting classified information in secret is called espionage, and he was working for the U.S. Special Services, some other agencies. I don't think he was working for Monaco, as Monaco is hardly interested in. So he is saying, yeah, we know he is. Uh, a U.S. secret agent, so... Think that information. It is up to special services to come to an agreement. From the, which country would he work for? Well, not Monaco, it must be the U.S. Some groundwork has been laid. There are people who, in our view, are not connected with special services. Let me tell you a story about a person serving a sentence in an allied country of the U.S. That first this could be um, a, a Russian agent in prison in Germany, potentially. And due to patriotic sentiments, eliminated a bandit in one of the European capitals. Berlin. Berlin. There was a shooting and a Russian was arrested. During the events in the Caucasus, do you know what he was doing? I don't want to say that, but... I will do it anyway. He was laying our soldiers, taken prisoner, on the road and then drove his car over their heads. What kind of person is that? Can he even be called human? But there was a patriot who eliminated him in one of the European capitals. Whether he did it of his own volition or not, that is a different question. Yeah, but Evan, what, 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 I mean, that's a completely different, I mean, I mean, this is a 32-year-old, like, newspaper. He committed. What is it about 32-year-old <laughs> spies? Um, do they get a free, free pass? I don't know. Something different. I mean, most Secret Service guys are recruited quite early on, so 32 is not, like, he's too young. No, he's not. He's too old. I mean, you know. Strange point. He's not just a journalist. I reiterate, he's a journalist who was secretly getting confidential information. Yes, it is different, but still, I'm talking about other people who are essentially controlled by the U.S. authorities wherever they are serving a sentence. There is an ongoing dialogue between the special services. This has to be resolved in a calm, responsible and professional manner. They are keeping in touch, so let them do their work. I do not rule out that the person you refer to, Mr. Gershkovitz, may return to his motherland. By the end of the day, it does not make any sense to keep him in prison in Russia. We want the U.S. Special Services to think about how they can contribute to achieving the goals our Special Services are pursuing. We are ready to talk. Moreover, the talks are on their way. And there have been many successful examples of these talks crowned with success. Probably this is going to be crowned with success as well. So Russia wants the one of their agents, probably the one in Berlin, uh, released uh, in exchange. And they're saying, well, why not? You want that one? We want that one. But we have to come to an agreement. I hope you let him out. Mr. President, thank you. <laughs> I also want him to return to his homeland at last. So he's not willing to just end the already quite a long interview um, and also not on uh, Carlson, uh, Tucker Carlson's point. Uh, just like, oh, thank you, I hope you let him out. That's it, end of interview. He decides when the interview ends, so it, it, it goes on for another few minutes. I'm absolutely sincere. But let me say once again, the dialogue continues. The more public we render things of this nature, the more difficult it becomes to resolve them. Okay, so he is also uh, pointing out that, look, these matters we can't in detail discuss here in public, um, and your Secret Service is talking to our Secret Service about this, and they're trying to find a solution. 
Everything has to be done in calm manner. I wonder if that's I wonder if that's, that's true with the, with the war, though, also. I mean, I just want to I guess I want to ask one more question, which is. And maybe you don't want to say so for strategic reasons. But are you worried that what's happening in Ukraine could lead to something much larger and much more horrible? And how motivated are you just to call the U.S. government and say, let's come to terms? <laughs> What sort of naive question is this? After all this, Tucker Carlson still sort of has as a premise that somehow Russia, led by President Putin, is the one that's been, you know, continuing the war, wanting the war. <laughs> that's what his question suggests. Why aren't you calling America? Well, Russia is constantly pointing out, let's negotiate, and in fact was a, a willing... Uh, and and uh, constructive partner in all sorts of negotiations, the Minsk agreements, which were broken by Ukraine and NATO members uh, as guarantors, and then the Istanbul um, negotiations were uh, withdrawn and then essentially ignored by by Ukraine. Um, and time and again, Russia was um, rebuffed, and um, it was consistently. The, the, the American, sometimes British side, doing whatever it takes to create war and continue the war. So what is this question about? Why aren't you calling the American leadership? Because the American leadership wants this war. That's the trouble. <laughs> well, he doesn't know what to say. <laughs> Послушайте, I already said that we did not refuse to talk. Exactly. We are willing to negotiate. It is the Western side, and Ukraine is obviously a satellite state of the US. It is evident. I do not want you to take it as if I am looking for a strong word or an insult. But we both understand what is happening. Hopefully. The financial support, 72 billion US dollars, was provided. Germany ranks second, then other European countries come. Dozens of billions of US dollars are going course, to yeah. Ukraine. There's a huge influx of weapons. In this case, you should tell the current Ukrainian leadership to stop and come to negotiating table, rescind this absurd decree. We did not refuse. Sure, but you already said it. I didn't think you meant it as an insult because you already said correctly, it's been reported that Ukraine was prevented from negotiating a peace settlement by the former British Prime Minister acting on behalf of the Biden administration. So of course they're a satellite, big countries control small countries, that's not new. And that's why I asked about dealing directly with the Biden administration, which is making these decisions, not President Zelensky of Ukraine. And what's your question? Well, if the administration of Zelensky in Ukraine was well, if the Zelensky administration in Ukraine refused to negotiate, I assume they did it under the instruction from Washington. If Washington believes it to be the wrong decision, let it abandon it. Let it find a delicate excuse so that no one is insulted. Let it come up with a way out. Exactly. So Zelensky passed a law saying that you must not Nobody must negotiate with um, with Russia, and as we all agree, that's done with U.S. well knowledge, but likely under U.S. instructions. That is U.S. policy. So Tucker Carlson, ask your U.S. leadership why don't they call up President Putin and say, "Hey, let's negotiate. Let's end the war." It was not us who made this decision. It was them. So let them go back on it, that is it. However, they made the wrong decision and now we have to look for a way out of the situation to correct their mistakes. They did it, so let them correct it themselves. We support this. So I just want to make sure I'm not misunderstanding what you're saying. I don't think that I am. I think you're saying you want a negotiated settlement to what's happening in Ukraine. <laughs> of course. Russia has constantly done that. <laughs> Right. And we made it. We prepared the huge document in Istanbul that was initialed by the head of the Ukrainian delegation. He affixed his signature to some of the provisions, 
Not to all of it. He put his signature and then he himself said, we were ready to sign it and the war would have been over long ago, 18 months ago. However, Prime Minister Johnson came, talked us out of it, and we missed that chance. Well, you missed it, you made a mistake, let them get back to that, that is all. Why do we have to bother ourselves and correct somebody else's mistakes? I know one can say it is our mistake. It was us who intensified the situation and decided to put an end to the war that started in 2014 in Donbas. As I have already said, by means of weapons. Let me get back to furthering history. I already told you this. We were just discussing it. Let us go back to 1991, when we were promised that NATO would not expand, to 2008, when the doors to NATO opened to the declaration of state sovereignty of Ukraine, declaring Ukraine a neutral state. Let us go back to the fact that NATO and U.S. military bases started to appear on the territory of Ukraine creating threats to us. Let us go back to coup d'etat in Ukraine in 2014. It is pointless though, isn't it? We may go back and forth endlessly, but they stop me. Do you think it's too humiliating at this point for NATO to accept Russian control of what was two years ago Ukrainian territory? I said, I said, uh, let them think how to do it with dignity. There are options if there is a will. Up until now, there has been the uproar and screaming about inflicting a strategic defeat on Russia on the battlefield. Now they are apparently coming to realize that it is difficult to achieve, if possible at all. In my opinion, it is impossible by definition. It is never going to happen. It seems to me that now, those who are in power in the West have come to realize this as well. If so, if the realization has set in, they have to think what to do next. We are ready for this dialogue. Would you be willing to say, congratulations, NATO, you won, and just keep the situation where it is now? You know, it is a subject matter for the negotiations. No one is willing to conduct or, to put it more accurately, they are willing but do not know how to do it. I know they want to. It. it is not just I see it, but I know they do want it. But they are struggling to understand how to do it. They have driven the situation to the point where we are at. It is not us who have done that. It is our partners, opponents who have done that. Well, now let them think how to reverse the situation. We're not against it. It would be funny if it were not so sad. This endless mobilization in Ukraine, the hysteria, the domestic problems, sooner or later it will result in agreement. You know, this probably sounds strange given the current situation. But the relations between the two peoples will be rebuilt anyway. It will take a lot of time, but they will heal. I'll give you very unusual examples. There is a combat encounter on the battlefield. Here is a specific example. Ukrainian soldiers got encircled. This is an example from real life. Our soldiers were shouting to them, there is no chance, surrender yourselves, come out and you will be alive. Suddenly, the Ukrainian soldiers were screaming from there in Russian, perfect Russian, saying, Russians do not surrender and all of them perished. They still identify themselves as Russian. Amazing, amazing story. I mean, I believe him. Uh, because that's the sort of thing that would be reported up the chain of command, uh, you can imagine. Uh, quite dramatic, quite dramatic. 
and and of course that is the heartbreak of the Russians having to fight their brothers uh, in Ukraine. And of course many Ukrainians don't want to fight the Russians, uh, but they're forced by their own government um, and the government is imposed by the US. So these are the real criminals making two brother countries fight each other. What is happening is, to a certain extent, an element of a civil war. Everyone in the West thinks that the Russian people have been split by hostilities forever. No, they will be reunited. The unity is still there. Why? Extraordinary, if you think about it. You know, he's quite confident they will be reunited. The Ukrainian authorities dismantling the Ukrainian Orthodox Church because it brings together not only the territory, it brings together our souls. No one will be able to separate the soul. Wow, that's quite a dramatic statement to end the interview on which he's going to now do because he's in charge of this interview. Shall we end here or is there anything else? No, I think that's great. I assume. Thank you, Mr. President. All right, there we are. Free that's it. Is bigger than any one person or any one